this morning. Amen. Worthy 
that that's our prayer this evening that the Lord would show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me
Amen. Come on now. God is so good. Amen. Come on now, church. I said, Amen. He is a good God. You know why He's a good God? That's all He is. Amen. He is intrinsically good in and out. Everything He created was good. And so He is a good God today. He'll be a good God tomorrow. Even when you're having a bad day, he's still a good God. Come on now. I'm about to preach. Y'all sit down. 
Um, I about done got excited on that song. He's a good God. See, when God created, He looked at it and said it was good because it's what He did. And in my life, what He did is good. But I did not so much. But anyway, He's a good God tonight. Man, we've been having a good revival this week. I'm telling you, I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle. And I'm going to keep my two-edged sword close because I know the enemy's always trying to get in my face. Amen? I don't think y'all believed last night's message. I lost y'all somewhere there. But anyway, uh, as our ushers come tonight, we're going to receive an offering. And uh, we pray that you would give tonight. If you're not prepared to give, there's no pressure on you at all. Everything we take up tonight will go to Pastor Robert and his ministry. If you want to make a check out, you can make it to FIMC. We'll make sure he gets every dime you give. We want to be a blessing to him. He's been with us all week away from his family. We know they're precious to him. Uh, I remember when him and Amanda were dating before they had children. I actually remember before he was dating anybody and getting on to him and Marshall and Adam and all of them at youth camp like I had to get on to some of y'all over there. But anyway, here he is now, a grown man with a great ministry. Father, in Jesus' name, bless us tonight as we give. We know that you always bless those who give, and you love a cheerful giver. That's in your word. And we want to be a blessing to Pastor Robert. So tonight, in Jesus' name, move on people's heart. Amen. Let me remind you, when you came in, there was a, a blue card on your seat. We've got a big block party coming up on a Saturday. Wow. Uh, turn to the person next to you and say, you don't want to miss this. So, uh, hamburgers, hot dogs on the grill until they're all gone. Uh, we're going to have all kind of games. We need all our FIMC people here because we're going to reach out to the community uh, and try to get them to come down here and be with us on that Saturday evening. We're just going to have a great time that day. And we're going to fellowship together. We're going to give away prizes. And so we're excited about that. So mark that down. Also, this next Sunday, we continue our series, The Next. Let's say it together. The Next. And this week is consistency. We're going to look at the consistent life of Joseph. Even when he had bad days, people lied about him. When people did him wrong, he was consistent in his life. It's an amazing thing. It's getting close to deer season, and God's given me a lot of messages while I've been in the deer stand. This morning, he gave me the three points. It's not deer season yet, so I wasn't hunting. Okay, don't turn me in. All right? So, uh, I was shooting my bow early this morning and God gave me the three points isn't that too cool I mean I didn't even ask him to and so I was like thank you Lord amen I appreciate that Pastor Robert come preach to us it's been a blessing to be with you guys uh, tonight is our, our last night everybody say boo. boo man I'm just as upset about it as you guys are uh, I mean, this really is a great church uh, from the top down. You guys got a great pastor. Let's give it up for Pastor Hal. Great, great youth pastor, right? Ethan, great youth pastor. And then even some great members in this room, right? Great members. We've had some, we've had some great food. And uh, my prayer tonight is that God would give us a great message. He'd give us a great message. And so, uh, really what I'd like to happen tonight is that the message would make a difference in somebody's life here. My, my prayer really would be that tonight's message would uh, set some people free, just like when I was studying this, how, how it, it set me free. And so, I, I need you guys to do me a favor. Can you do me a favor? Yeah. I need you to stay with me, okay? Because it's going to take us just a little while to get there. I'll have you out here by midnight, I promise. Uh, but let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for life today. You woke us up. And you set us on our way. Father, we've got air in our lungs. Father, we are truly blessed. And so tonight I pray that as we've gathered here, 
Father, that truly you would show up. Father, that you would speak. And Father, that you would do the miraculous tonight. I pray, Father, that you would speak through me, that you would use me. Father, I pray that I would decrease and you would increase. I pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So I wonder tonight as we get started, uh, how many of you would just be honest and admit that you've had maybe a moment or maybe some moments in your life where somebody made you just downright mad? Somebody made you, somebody made you mad? Uh, if the person sitting next to you, don't point at them, you know what I'm saying? Uh, don't look at them real bad. I just want to know if it happened, not who did it. Uh, but I think it happens to all of us from time to time. Uh, I remember one time several years ago, uh, I was at the house one morning and I walked into our hall bathroom and our hall bathroom had this this window above above the bathtub that kind of let natural light in and so I walk in and I got my head down and I kind of look at the floor and I see this shadow on the floor and I thought man that's weird that's not normal and then I saw the shadow move and so I thought what what in the world is that and so I'm I'm, I'm looking up and uh, as I look up, I look at the shower curtain. And on the shower curtain, uh, if I'm exaggerating, it's, it's only slightly. But uh, there's a spider on that shower curtain the size of Texas, okay? It's huge. That thing is big. And I don't know if you, you, you know this or not, uh, but I don't like spiders. I'm scared of spiders. Uh, Amanda at the house, she, she's only four ten and a half, but she is the spider killer at our house. I can kill a wasp. I can kill an ant. I can kill a roach. I can kill whatever else. Uh, but I don't mess with no spiders. And so uh, there's this spider in there. And so I freak out. And so I start yelling, Amanda! Amanda, you got to get in here. Amanda, I need you. Amanda, you got to do something. But she's not answering me. And I realize about that moment that she's already gone. That she's already gone to work. That she's left the house. And so I begin to think, you know, what should I do? Should I just shut the door and leave the spider in there all along? Uh, all alone uh, but then my mind started thinking about something I seen on Facebook one day on the interwebs you know about this spider that crawled into this person's ear and laid eggs out like it don't really happen it does it was on the interwebs it's true okay and so I was like man I I said man I don't know what I don't know what to do and so at that moment I kind of hear this voice in my head say man up and I was like I know you ain't talking to me voice whoever you are man up and so and so I heard it again I heard it say, man up. And so I said, okay, 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 okay. I said, uh, I said, all right. I said, all right, uh, man, that, that spot about to find out who I am. That spot about to find out whose house this is. This is my house. And so I take off my flip flop. Y'all always wonder if I always wear these. So I, this is a true story. I take off my flip flop and I'm, I see that spot. I said, spider, you see this? You about to get God. I'm about to get you. You about to get yours. And so I'm swinging my flip flop, almost like a baseball player swings a bat. You know what I'm saying? I'm getting ready to hit that spider, that huge spider that's on that shower curtain. And so I'm counting to three. I say, all right, one, two, two and a half, two and three quarters. And then I'm, I seriously, I swing that flip flop with all my might. You know what I'm saying? And as I'm swinging, that spider kind of moves up the shower curtain a little bit. Well, so I'm swinging with all my might, and you can't stop mid-swing, right? So I actually miss that spider, but I still hit the shower curtain. And when I hit the shower curtain, because I had swung and hit below it, the force from that swing launched that spider right at me. All I saw was these claws and eyes ah, coming at me like that. And man... I, that spider was screaming at me and yelling at me and all this other good stuff. And so have y'all ever seen the movie The Matrix? Man, that's what I did like Keanu Reeves dodging bullets. But I'm dodging this huge spider that's coming at me, man. And man, I hit that spider so hard. I'm on the floor, but I hit that. I hit the shower curtain so hard that the force actually slung that spider out into the hallway. And so I slammed the bathroom door. I'm freaking out. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, big spider, big spider. <laughs> I'm trying to get my breath. This is a true story. And so I'm trying to get my breath. Once I calm down, I peek out the door. <laughs> trying to see where that spider was. You know what I'm saying? Because again, I don't want him to make a nest in my head or nothing like that. But I couldn't find him. In fact, I don't know where that spider went. We, we put a for sale sign on that house and sold it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not like, uh, hey, 
And I don't know, I don't know, but the person who bought our house didn't stay there very long either, okay? So I, I don't know. But man, I, I remember I was mad. Man, I was mad. I was mad at that spider. I was mad at Amanda. When I needed her the most, she wasn't there. Everybody say, y'all. Thank you so much. But for real, I was mad at Amanda because I knew, I said, man, before she left, she went into this bathroom. She had to have seen that spider. She saw that spider. I mean, it was big enough to blot out the sun. Literally, the shadow was on the floor. She had to have seen that spider. She left that spider there because she wanted to terrify me. She left that spider there because she wanted to scare me. She left that spider there because she wanted that spider to kill me. She, this is what I'm thinking. She just wanted the insurance money when I die. She don't love me. I, I was mad. Again, there are times in our lives where things happen and we get mad. We get mad when we feel like people have wronged us. We get mad at people just because we assume that somewhere along the way they have done something to wrong us. It's true. Think about our nation. Man, we live in a society where everybody is mad at everybody. We live in a society where everybody's offended. We live in a society where everybody boycotts and everybody protests and they're upset. I'm serious. We live in a society where everybody's bitter. They've got that resting bitterness face. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They got it. Oh, you offended me. They offended me. Then people get offended because somebody else is offended. Well, if you're offended, then I'm offended. I'm cra it's crazy. We, we live in a society where everybody is just angry. And so we'll lash out on social media and we'll say things and we'll use hashtags like sorry, not sorry. And we'll say things like, well, I'm just going to speak my mind. We'll say things like, I'm just going to keep it real. I'm going to speak my mind. We'll be downright rude and ugly and mean. And we justify the way we're acting because we feel like we've been offended. But the Bible says that's not how we're supposed to live our lives. The Bible says that if you are a Christian, you are supposed to live differently. That, that, that what is it, golden rod's got me. I'll pray for me, man. These allergies messing me up. But the Bible actually says that we've got to get rid and to remove bitterness from our lives. In fact, I want you to see something. If you've got your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. As you're turning there, I'll give you a little information. The book of Hebrews is kind of surrounded by mystery. We don't really know who wrote the book of Hebrews. There are a lot of people who speculate, but you don't have an author that just claims ownership of it or authorship of it. Like a lot of times people will say like, I Paul, I John, I, I Peter, but you don't, you don't see that. And so people speculate as to who wrote the book, but they don't know for sure in the book of Hebrews. We don't even know who the book was actually written to. Again, people speculate, but it's obvious that the book of Hebrews was written to uh, Jesus believing Jews who were in danger of actually falling away from faith. And so look at what the author says in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 14. He says, make every effort to live in peace with every one. Now, let me stop. How many people are we supposed to live at peace with? Every one. And so look what the scripture says, make every piece to live in peace, uh, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Why? Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Verse 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, I'm convinced that one of the greatest tools our enemy tries to use to destroy us and to destroy our relationships is what the Bible describes as a bitter root or a root of bitterness. Think about it. We know that God wants us to love, right? But what does the enemy do? The enemy tries to kill love and intimacy in relationships. We know that God wants us to trust, but then what does our enemy do? Our enemy tries to steal trust and leave us bitter. 
the enemy will actually do everything possible to plant a seed of offense in your heart. He will. He'll, he'll do everything he can to plant a seed of offense in your life so that a root of bitterness will take root in your life and in my life. And it might start out as something small. Like how many of you got the Facebook? You got the Facebook? You got a book? Of, you're on the book of faces? Anybody? A couple of people. All right. All right. But how many of y'all, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, you get on Facebook and, you're, you know, you, there's one of your friends and you're always liking their pictures. You're always liking their pictures and you're always commenting on their pictures and they never like your pictures and they never comment on your pictures. And then you find out the reason why is because they have unfollowed you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you get mad. This, this, this seed of offense, this root of bitterness, or what about this? Sometimes you send somebody a text message, right? You'll send them a text message and you know, they got it. It says delivered. You look back at it and it says that they read it at a certain time. You're sitting there and you see the bubbles pop up like they're going to respond, but then they don't respond. And you're like, why aren't they responding to me? And so what happens is you get offended and a root of bitterness grows up. A root of bitterness can come from little things, but it can also come from something big. Like maybe you're here tonight and someone took advantage of you. Someone really misled you. Somebody really betrayed you. And a real seed of offense has taken root in your heart. And it's grown into this root of bitterness. Well, the thing that I hope that you'll understand tonight is that you can't control what happens to you. You can't. You can't control what happens to you. You can't control what people do to you. You can't control what people say about you. You can't control what people think about you. But you know what you can control? You can control how you respond. You can. And so with, with God's help, and with God's help, you, you, can, you, can, you, can actually, you can actually respond in a way that is God honoring. So what is the problem really with bitterness? Well, let me point out two things to you tonight. Two problems with bitterness. If you're keeping notes, you want to write them down. Like I've told you all week, when you write stuff down, it encourages the person who's preaching. When you write things down, also you're more, you're more likely to remember it, right? And so here's the problem with bitterness. The first problem is bitterness has a dangerous root. Bitterness has a dangerous root. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 again. The Bible says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now, I think it's interesting that the author of the book of Hebrews in this particular verse chooses to use the word root under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is the word that is chosen to use. See, I don't know if you're like me, but I like to do yard work. Anybody else you like to do yard work? I, I really do. I like, to do. I like to do yard work. Cutting grass was actually my first job. Uh, growing up, didn't have a dad, and so uh, my mom worked two jobs to take care of me and my sister and my granny. And so if I wanted something, I had to buy it. And so I remember when I was 10 years old, we had a push mower. And I would literally push that mower around our neighborhood. And there were several yards in our neighborhood that I, once I pushed it there, I would push and cut their grass just to make a little money. And so I did that for several years. And I remember actually when I was in college, Wesley College, I worked for a landscaping company in the summers. And so we would cut grass at homes. We would cut grass at businesses. We would cut grass at apartment complexes, and the company that I worked for was a total landscaping company, a total landscaping business, which meant that we were not only responsible for cutting the grass and weed eating, but we were also responsible for keeping up the flower beds, keeping up the flower beds. And what that meant was you had to pull weeds. Well, I hated to pull weeds. Uh, I, I really did. Anybody else, have you ever had to pull weeds? You hate pulling weeds? Uh, I, hate, I hate to pull weeds. The reason why is because sometimes you'll go up to a little weed that's in your flower bed and you'll go to pull it up. And what will happen is it will actually just break off right there at the ground. It'll just break off. And so when that thing just breaks off, you know what? You can bet that that plant, that weed is actually going to grow right back. Why? Because you didn't remove the root. I hated it. I hated it because of that. Another reason why I hated to pull weeds was because you might walk up to something that looked really small. 
you might walk up to something that looked really small, it looked like it'd be really easy to pull out of the ground. But once you would grab a hold of it, it'd be like pulling Excalibur from the stone. You know what I mean? Some of you are like, I don't know what that is. Somebody like picking up Thor's hammer. You know what I mean? It would just seem impossible. And so you'd look at that little weed and you'd think, I'm not going to let that weed get the best of me. And so you're pulling and you're actually pulling all the leaves off of that thing and you're working and you're getting upset and you're kicking dirt and you're trying to pull it up. And so you start to get kind of angry and you start to get kind of, kind of bitter. Another reason why I didn't like to pull those weeds was because we had to pull weeds around the swimming pool where the girls were. And let me tell you, it doesn't, you don't look real cool when you walk up to a little weed like this and you're, you're trying to look cool and buff for all these girls. Like, you can't do it. They're like, what is wrong with him? He can't even pull that little twig out of the ground. Again, I hated to pull weeds. But again, sometimes you can't pull them up because of that root system. Roots are tough. And do you know why roots are tough? Because roots actually spread out. They spread out. How many of you have ever heard of something called pando? You ever heard of something called pando? Some people, maybe not, maybe not, maybe not. Uh, pando, uh, it's actually a Latin word, and it actually means I spread out or I take root. You can actually see pando in uh, south central Utah. I got some pictures here they're going to put on the screen for you. This is, this is actually what pando uh, looks like. It should be at the end of that thing there. Y'all see this? This is pando, okay? This is real. This is pando. So we got a couple pictures that are going to kind of flip through it there. You look at that, right? And you're like, man, that's beautiful. And it really is. It is beautiful. Look at all that. Isn't that beautiful? You look at that and you say, man, those are some beautiful trees. But you know what? It's not a bunch of trees. It's not a bunch of trees. What you're looking at in that picture, all of that comes from one root system. That's one root system. And it covers 106 acres underground. Underground, it's the oldest living organism on planet Earth. And the reason why is because its roots go so deep that it's been able, and that's why it's been able to survive for so long. What happens every year is Pando continues to grow because one of those roots will come up out of the ground and those sprouts will grow and they can grow up to 82 feet tall. But again, it's just one root system. I'm telling you, Roots are tough. Roots will spread out. And the thing about roots is you can't see them. Because they're underneath the soil. They're underneath the surface. And when roots, when roots really do grow, grow deeper and deeper, they make it actually harder to remove the plant. That's why the Bible says, see to it that no bitter root grows up. See to it that no bitter root actually takes root. You've got to make sure that this doesn't happen because once those bitter roots sink into you, once those bitter roots sink into you and they grow deep, those roots of bitterness will affect every other area of your life. They will. Think about a flower bed. Why do you want the weeds gone from the flower bed? Because if you let the weeds grow in that flower bed, it's going to rob all the flowers that you actually want there of the nutrients they need to actually survive. I'm telling you, bitterness has a dangerous root, a root that will rob all the good things that God wants to grow in your life. It's a root that will, that will keep all the things that God wants to grow in your life from actually springing up. But you think, well, that doesn't sound very dangerous, but it is. In fact, let me show you how dangerous, let me show you how dangerous these bitter roots can actually be. I want you to see something that Jesus says about bitterness and about harboring unforgiveness. This is a spiritual reality. This is a spiritual law that Jesus is establishing. And he does it in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. The Bible actually says this. It says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me. And Peter says seven times. Now let me stop. Because here you're supposed to forgive somebody seven times. That sounds like a lot, right? How many of y'all be like, hey, you know, fool me once. Shame on me. You know, fool me twice. I'm going to punch you in the throat. Uh, anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? right in Jesus' name. Uh, again. But Peter asked Jesus, should I forgive seven times? And when Peter says seven times, that really is a lot. 
because the religious leaders and the rabbis, rabbis of this time actually taught that when you forgive somebody, you should forgive somebody three or four times. And so when Peter says forgive seven times, he's being very generous. He's actually going, he's going higher than what the regular train of thought or the school of thought was for that time. And so look at what Jesus says in verse 21 in response. In verse 22 in response uh, to him. Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. How many times did Jesus say? 70 times seven. Seven, that's 490 times. I don't know how to work it out with common core, you know what I'm saying? But I know in my mind that's 490 times. So what is Jesus actually saying there? Is Jesus saying that you should just walk around with a notebook and that you should just keep a log and every time somebody harms you, offends you, that's one. When somebody, that's two. When your child, that is 300. When your spouse gets on your nerves, you know what I mean? You're like, that is 498. And when they, when they get, or 489, and when they get to 490, you say, hey, you are working on my last nerve. And like, once you get past it, this is it. Is that what Jesus is saying? Is that how we're supposed to live our life? No. What Jesus is actually saying here, when he says that we should forgive 70 times 7, is that we should forgive people as many times as it's necessary. Now, I didn't really understand what this looked like until I had experienced deep hurt in my life. About seven years ago, I had some people who really hurt me at my core. And the truth of the matter is, There are people who sometimes hurt us by accident. And it might not have been a deep hurt. But when they hurt you, they can come and they can apologize. And a lot of times, because it wasn't deep hurt, you're able to forgive. And you don't really give it another thought. Has has that ever happened to you? But there are also times where we experience deep hurt. Soul-piercing hurt, hurt that's unjust, hurt that's unprovoked, hurt that you didn't deserve. Has anybody ever been there? And it wasn't until I had experienced that kind of hurt that I really understood what Jesus was trying to say here. See, again, there are some people who have hurt me. (laughs) I'm talking about hurt me to my core. And I've forgiven them. But sometimes when I see them, sometimes when I just hear their name, it's like something tries to rise up within me. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, I've already forgiven them, but I'll see them. And again, I'll, I'll just hear their name and something in me will try to rise up. Bitterness will again try to take root. And it's in those moments that I have to say, no, I forgive them. I mean, I've already forgiven them, but I forgive them again and again and again and again. 70 times 7, I forgive them as many times as necessary. And that's how the Bible says we have to be. Because it's dangerous if we don't. I'm serious. Jesus goes on in this chapter in verse 23 to tell a story. I want you to see this. Jesus says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars do you see that s millions plural i don't know if you had a gambling problem or what but it's a lot of money verse 25 he couldn't pay so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife his children and everything he owed to pay the debt now i know that sounds harsh to maybe sell a husband a wife and children to pay a debt but during jesus's time that was normal practice this is how it was verse 26 But the man fell down before the master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay 
at all. Now let me stop right there because there was no possible way that this servant would have been able to pay back the millions of dollars that he owed. It was impossible. Right here, he's just desperate. He's desperate. He's grasping for straws. He's just begging not to become a slave for his family, not to become a slave. And so look at verse 27. The Bible says, then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. Folks, this is unbelievable. How much did he owe? Millions. This is like winning the lottery. This is like winning the lottery. All this debt just being wiped out. Verse 28. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I'll pay it, he pleaded. This fellow servant basically says the same exact words that this guy had told his master. And I wonder it, at any point as he was listening to that fellow servant talk, if he, were, he was reminded of what had happened for him, if he was reminded of the words that he had actually used, except, again, he owed this much larger debt. Verse 30, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. So what happens to this guy? He, he gets sent to prison, right? But it's not, he's not just in prison. What happens to him? I mean, if prison would have been bad enough, but he's tortured. And look at verse 35. This is, this is crazy. Jesus says, that's how my heavenly father will be, will do to you. To who? To you. To me. To us. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. The truth is, people, if we don't forgive people, Jesus says we won't be forgiven. You say it doesn't really say that. We'll go to Matthew chapter 6. Again, here's a spiritual law that Jesus establishes, a spiritual reality. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, he says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sin. Folks, I'm telling you, you simply cannot let bitterness take root. It's dangerous. See to it that no bitter root takes, takes hold. Make sure it doesn't happen. Bitterness can keep you from living the life that God wants you to live. We talked about it a couple nights ago. Not settling. Don't settle. If you take bitterness, you are settling for less than what God has for you. Bitterness. The inability to let things go, it can cause you to defile yourself. And so the second thing that I want you to see is not only does bitterness have a dangerous root, but bitterness produces a poisonous fruit. Bitterness produces a poisonous fruit. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 again. The Bible says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, bitterness won't just cause you trouble. It will cause trouble for many others. Bitterness won't just defile you. Bitterness will defile many. You've heard the old saying that says one rotten apple will what? Spoil the bunch. Spoil the bunch. And you've seen this. How many of you ever worked somewhere and there was one bitter employee that just brought down the entire work environment? One bitter employee made the entire work environment toxic. Maybe a husband or a wife is just bitter and they bring down the emotional level in the house. See, here's what bitterness produces. Bitterness will dominate you mentally. You won't enjoy the things that you used to enjoy because bitterness will invade your thoughts and consume you. You'll think about ways to get even. 
I heard about this man who actually got bit by a dog and the dog had rabies. And so when they took a test at the hospital to, to check on the man, they found out that the man actually had contracted rabies uh, from this dog. And this was before there was a cure. And so the doctor went to the man and he said, look, I don't want to give you any kind of false hope here. We're going to try to comfort you. Uh, but my advice to you, my best advice to you is for you to get your affairs, your affairs in order and you do it very soon. And so as you can imagine, this man was shocked. Depression sank in. And so finally, this man mustered up enough strength to ask for a pen and a piece of paper. And so he started writing down really fast. So about an hour later, the doctor came back and the man was still writing down very fast. And the doctor says, I see that you took my advice. I assume that you're writing out your will. And the man said, this isn't a will. This is a list of people I want to bite before I die. I don't write them all, you know. But the truth of the matter is, there are some people who have been hurt. And because they've been hurt, and because they can't let it go, it's consuming their thoughts. Bitter people who have been bitten spend all their time thinking about biting others, and they actually snap at other people. Bitterness makes you permanently angry. It will carve deep wrinkles and lines into your face. And it will add heaviness to your steps. Bitterness will also depress you emotionally. It will, it will also debilitate you physically. It will cause your blood pressure to rise and your heart to beat faster. Because the end goal of bitterness, do you know what it is? To destroy you spiritually. Who did we talk about last night? The enemy. Who only comes to steal. Who only comes to kill. Who only comes to destroy. I, I, I'm telling you, the fruit that bitterness produces is poisonous. And the enemy wants you to consume it. The enemy wants you to eat it. That's why we've got to follow what Ephesians chapter 4 verses 31 and 32 tell us. Look at what it says. It says, get rid of all bitterness. Everybody say all. all. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Amen. But Robert, it's hard to get rid of all bitterness. I know. But you know what I love about God? Here's what I love about God. I love that God would never ask you or me to do something that he himself wouldn't do. I love that God never asked us to do something that he actually did not do. See, folks, there's, I, I, I just love the word. We talked about it again. Uh, we talked about, look, I, I love the word and I love how everything in the Bible is connected. There's nothing that's in the Bible just to be there. If you can't make the connection, if I can't make the connection, we just ain't made the connection yet. But there's nothing just to be in there, okay? I love that. And in Psalm 69, there's a messianic prophecy. What does that mean? It means it's talking about something that will be fulfilled through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Psalm 69 verse 21 says this. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Well, again, these are events that will be fulfilled or that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so when I see this, when I read this first, I'm like, man, what in the world is gall? I'm from Pearl, Mississippi. I graduated, you know, pretty, pretty low. I wasn't real smart. Ryan, I'll tell y'all. But I, I was like, what is gall? I've never heard that word before unless the word bladder was after it. Gall bladder. <laughs> so did they, did they give Jesus a gall bladder and say, here you go? Is that what that means? No. That word, that word gall in the Hebrew is marah. Marah. And that word is translated bitterness. Bitterness. So that verse says that they put bitterness in his food. And they gave him vinegar for his thirst. Vinegar. Well, that's not referring to the vinegar that you and I would buy 
at the grocery store. It's actually referring to sour wine. You got to stay with me. You got to see this. I'm wrapping up too. But I want you to think about who Jesus was. I want you to think about who Jesus is. Jesus was fully God. And Jesus was fully man. And he entered into ministry at 30 years of age. And he had a three-year ministry. And the religious people hated him. The religious people followed him around, trying to trap him and catch him in some sort of lie or doing something wrong that they could use to try and discredit him. But when that could not happen, you know what they did? They plotted his death. We're just going to kill him. But it wasn't just the religious leaders that plotted his death. It was one of those closest to him for three years. Judas plotted with the religious people. He goes to the religious leaders and says, what will you give me if I betray him? They say, 30 pieces of silver. Praise the Lord, I'll take it, he said. And so one night Jesus gathers his disciples for the last supper. And before they eat, Jesus gets down on his knees. And he washes his disciples' feet. Very lovingly. Even Judas, the one who he knew was fixing to betray him. And so after he's washed their feet, Jesus approaches the table. And he serves the disciples a meal in a very loving way. And Judas leaves. He leaves the table to go and meet up with the religious leaders. And Jesus takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, guys, I need you. Right now, I need you. I need you to pray. Jesus goes on up a little ways and he starts to pray. And after he's prayed for a little while, he stands up and he walks back to his disciples. And what are they doing? They're sleeping. They let him down. Jesus says, man, I need you to pray. You don't understand. I need you to pray. Pray with me. And so Jesus goes back to praying. And you know what the disciples do again? They fall asleep. Jesus basically wakes them up so they can witness what happens to him. And here comes Judas, along with some soldiers. And Judas walks over to Jesus and betrays him with a kiss. Friend. Of course, Jesus is arrested and all the other disciples, they run, they flee. And Jesus is put on trial. And it's a joke of a trial. Jesus is condemned to die. But before they kill him, man, they put a crowd of thorns on his head. And they take a rod and they beat that crown of thorns into his head, deep into his skull. What's that? What's that mean? They, they flogged him with a cat of nine What is that? It's a wooden handle with nine leather strips on it. And at the end of each one of those strips was, was metal and glass and bone. And it was designed in such a way that every time they hit Jesus, that it would dig into his back and it would rip his muscle and tendons from his bones. If that wasn't enough, man. Then they ripped off his garments. Those garments that that cat and nine tail had dug deep into him. And every time they ripped those garments off, they did more damage to Jesus. Causing more pain. They mocked him. And 
and they hit him. And they said, Jesus, why don't you tell us? Why don't you prophesy who it is that hit you? And they spit on him. And they forced him to carry his cross to the place of the skull, to Golgotha. The place where they would ultimately kill him. And as he carried his cross, the ridicule continued. People threw things at him. They hurled insults at him. They spit on him. And he finally gets to the place of the skull. And they nail nails through his wrist. And they nail nails through his ankles. And then they raise him up on that cross. But the cross wasn't way up in the air. A lot of scholars believe that the cross was just high enough to where people could come by with sticks as he hung there and poke him to continue to mock him. He was just high enough to where grown men could walk up and urinate on his feet. Folks, they did this to Jesus. And every time Jesus needed to breathe, he would have to pull himself up putting tension on those wounds, causing more pain. And all the while, people continued to mock him. And he's crucified between two criminals. And even one of the criminals mocks him and hurls insults at him. I don't know about you, but if that was me, I'd have been tempted to be mad. I'd have been tempted to be bitter. I'd have been tempted to seek vengeance. Folks, Jesus is thirsty. I mean, he's been through more than we can possibly imagine. He's been more been through more than we can believe. And he's thirsty. And I want you to see Matthew chapter 27, verse 34. This is fulfillment, Psalm 69. The Bible says there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink this. Don't miss this, man. This blew my mind. What did they offer Jesus to drink? Gall. What is that? Bitterness. I need you to see this. Jesus had the opportunity to drink bitterness, to consume bitterness. But the Bible says that after tasting it, he refused to drink it. You know what this shows me about this world in which you and I live? It shows me that in this world, you and I are going to taste bitterness. We're going to have people that are going to do things to us that are bad. We're going to have many trials. We're going to have many sorrows. We're going to have people intentionally hurt us, accidentally hurt us. And some of that hurt's going to be real. Some of it's going to be deep. Some of it's going to be painful. Some of it's going to be shocking. You're going to taste bitterness. I'm going to taste bitterness. We're all going to taste bitterness. The question is... Once you've tasted it, will you actually drink it? Again, you got to understand. Jesus is thirsty. You can't imagine what he's been through. He's dehydrated. He just needs something to drink. And that's what's offered to him. He wanted to drink it. And I believe that for you and for me, there are going to be times in our life where things happen and you're one, you're going to want to be mad. You're going to want to be angry. You're going to want to have vengeance. You're going to want to be bitter, but it's in those moments that you have a choice because remember what I said at the beginning of the message, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond gonna taste bitterness but when we do we got a choice 
The Bible says Jesus tasted it and he refused to drink it. Not only did he refuse to drink it, but you know what else he did? He prayed for those who were doing all this to him with his arms stretched wide open. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. See, Jesus understood that bitterness has a dangerous root. Jesus understood that bitterness produces a poisonous fruit. My question is, do you understand that? Do I understand that? Because if we do, if we did, we know that we got to let stuff go. A bitter life is no way to live your life. A bitter life is no way to live your life. There's a better way. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32, again says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Is there some bitterness that you need to let go of today? You want to hang on to it just a little bit. That's what the devil wants. He wants you to eat that. Why? Because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Hey, hey, hang on just a little bit of it. So what do you want? But the Bible says get rid of it all. Is there something you need to let go of? Is there somebody you need to forgive? I've been there. Deep, deep hurt a better way to live folks so with every head bowed and every eye closed I don't know where you're at in your spiritual life but I wonder today if you just admit you know what there is something there is something that I've been holding on to something that really is affecting other areas of my life a past hurt a current hurt but it's affecting your life and your relationships and you'd say today I know I need to let it go if you'd say Robert will you pray for me that I'll have the strength to forgive as many times as necessary. 70 times seven. Forgive others the same way God has forgiven me. If you'd say, pray for me, Robert, as I do that. I'm just going to ask it right where you are. You lift your hand. You've been hurt. Amen. A lot of hands. A lot of hands. That's that bait of Satan. Father, tonight I pray for these who've raised their hands indicating that they recognize this root of bitterness that has sprung up in their life. Father, right now, I pray that you would remove that root. Your word says that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, that you'll You'll be able to cast mountains into the oceans. That we'll be able to uproot trees. And so right now, I pray that you would uproot some things that are in people's lives. Father, I pray that you would take it away. That we would say right now, devil, you've had control for too long. You've been holding me back and I'm not going to settle. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower us to do what your word says, to do what you actually did. Thank you, Father, for your example. 
Again, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, but maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I just want you to know that I grew up mad at God. My father left when I was born, committed suicide when I was five, never had a dad. Mad at God, bitter is what I was. And maybe that's not your story, but maybe your story is similar. Maybe you look back on your life and you see some unfortunate events and you want to be mad at God because He could have done something. You want to be mad at God because you feel like He did this. sang a song before we had our message it talked about God's goodness he is good all the time and if something bad has happened in your life I want you to know that God can turn that bad into something you got to surrender to him you got to give him your heart you got to give him your life you need to be saved and so if you want to take that step that's your next step to surrender to him right where you are I'm going to ask that you pray this prayer Father I need you I've been running from you I've been mad at you I've been bitter I pray that you would forgive me right now. I pray that you would save me. I confess you as Lord. I confess you as Savior. And I pray right now that you would uproot the bitterness that I've had in my life. And that you would actually make me into a new creation. Father, thank you for saving me help me follow you all the days of my life again our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed but I wonder today if there's somebody here who would say you know what today I did pray to receive Jesus I just gave my heart to him I surrendered to him if that's you again nobody's looking around it's just me but would you raise your hand so I'll know that you surrendered to Jesus tonight that you let go of what you thought he did to you amen Father, you're so good. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your word. And I pray, Father, that your word would come alive in our hearts and in our life. I pray that even though this is the last service of our revival, that revival wouldn't stop. I pray, Father, that you would continue to bring life every day. That you would continue to renew passion, to renew strength. I pray your blessings on each and every person here in this room. And I pray your blessings on this church. You are so good. And we thank you right now. We're fixing a scene. But if you need to come to the altar, maybe there's somebody in this room that you need to go and hug and forgive. encourage you to do whatever you feel like the Lord is telling you to do. God is good, folks. He's good.
just so good isn't it not a person in here probably hadn't been hurt probably not many of us that hadn't hurt somebody I know God spoke here tonight don't leave it here don't settle don't settle to live in bitterness. You know, I often wonder. The Bible says Jesus was beaten so they couldn't recognize him. And there he spanned in between heaven and the earth. Probably still people hollering. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I just wonder if somebody heard that and it convicted their heart. And they looked at Jesus and got saved at that moment. Nobody got saved when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. He was forgiving them for what they had done to him. But I think maybe somebody in response to that may have got saved. I know the centurion said, man, that must be the Son of God. Who responds like that? Christians do who don't want to live in bondage. Christians do. And let me give you this when we're gone. The devil will whisper in your ear and tell you this. If you forgive somebody, you're saying what they did to you is okay. But remember what Pastor said last night? He's a liar. That's not true. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Is he saying it was okay? What they did to him? No. He was releasing them. If you don't release and forgive, you're the one suffering. Wow, man. I'm so glad Jesus forgave me. <laughs> I remember when I got saved, I went around to people. I just loaded Miss Jo up in the car after asking her to forgive me. And I just started going to people and asking them to forgive me. I'm telling you, it gave me strength, guys. It just freed me even more. And the more I did it, the more I wanted to do it. Amen. I was just like, Lord, show me somebody else. I just, I want to be right. Not just right with you. I want to be right with others. I can say I don't hate anybody tonight because of Jesus. I really don't. I love people because Jesus loves me. And if he forgave us, we can forgive. Father, tonight in Jesus' name. I thank you that you forgave me and then empowered me to go ask for forgiveness from people that I really hurt when I lived as a drunk. Deep hurt. 
And I thank you since that day that you've empowered me to forgive people, to give and receive forgiveness. Lord, I pray tonight no one would leave here with bitterness tonight. If they're struggling with it right now, Lord, they need to stay afterwards. There's three pastors here. And we'd love to talk to you, help you. There's other Christians here. Father, I pray tonight <clears throat> for those who've been saved this week. If they want to take their next step, I pray they would come to me or Pastor E and so we can talk to them about their next step. Thank you for this revival. Thank you for Pastor Robert and Amanda. Lord, I, I know what he's talking about tonight because I prayed with him through a good bit of that along with other pastors and watched you work in his life. I pray your blessings on Elevate Church as he heads back there. They continue to grow and see people saved and they'd reach Vicksburg, Mississippi and beyond. And God, I pray for us this coming Sunday that we'd make it a priority to be in your house ready to take our next step. Dismiss us now in your love and grace. Dear Jesus, amen. God bless you.